BioBalance HealthCast, episode 259, Orgasm and Ejaculation in Women. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. In our most recent podcast, we talked about orgasms and ejaculation in men. And this week, we're going to change the focus and talk about orgasms and ejaculation in women. And I want to start with a term called anorgasmia. Uh, some women are not do, report that they have never felt an orgasm. They may have been sexual for a long time, uh, but they haven't had that experience. And I mean, I've had female clients that come to my office for counseling that will report they've been married 15, 20 years to the same guy that they love, but they've never had that experience that they read about or see in the movies mm-hmm. or nothing like that ever happens for them, that they, they have sex and then suddenly they're watching TV or something and it's <laughs> like, it just was over. <laughs> You know, uh, it felt nice, but it's over. That's well, they don't, but yeah, they don't have. But they the, don't have a the resolution a crescendo or a resolution mm-hmm. similar to what everybody expects culturally. Mm-hmm. And what we find with some of these women is that they don't have that because they have some trauma history mm-hmm. that interferes with the process. Mm-hmm. And physiologically, they may be having orgasms, but mm-hmm. the reality of that experience doesn't penetrate their mindset, so they don't know. Uh, And some of that is due to the way that they were abused or whatever the abuse was. Some of it, though, doesn't have anything to do with an abuse history at all. It has to do with a chemical imbalance, a hormonal imbalance Mm -hmm. in the system, which is where you come in with Mm -hmm. the treatments that you offer because you've had the same experience. These women come in and say, I've never been raped or I've never been molested, Mm -hmm. and yet I've never had an orgasm. Is it technique? Is it style? Is there something I can, is it thinking about something, you know, a a fantasy? What what can I do to try to accomplish that? And they'll often report, I'm not a very sexual person. I really don't want sex a lot. Mm -hmm. I will do it to be nice. I'll do it because you're supposed to, but I don't feel it. And then you do your magic and you get a phone call going, oh, my God, the postman is in danger. <laughs> well, really, their things, husbands are in danger. Their partners are in danger first. And yeah, then exactly. Everybody else is in danger for about a month. So so let's start there because <laughs> that's well, a very common experience. But that's you. sexual desire. Yeah. So that when oftentimes when people who are anorgasmic are also not very – their desire is not on a very high level. In general, when we look at their past, it is one of often very devoted men who have tried everything right. who, that they know of to help their wives or their partners have an orgasm or to to get the same thing out of sex that they do. Right. So it's not their partners. We've talked at length about that. But when we look at their blood work, they have very low testosterone levels at almost any age. And I mean, I often see people who are in their late 30s who have very low testosterone. Now, I don't see people who are going to have more children <laughs> at, in late 30s, but those who have completed childbearing who have always had low testosterone. I, when I say, I ask them, you know, have you ever had a, a big sex drive? Do you Have you ever, you know, like wanted to have sex um, except that your partner wanted to have sex. And, and they say no, that they just never felt very, very sexy, very sexual. They never were looking for anything like that in mm-hmm. a relationship. Then when we give them back their testosterone or we give them a reasonable amount of testosterone, right. let me, Not let me interject yeah. that everyone has the, the hormone level or the testosterone level that was genetically made for them, but it does not always make them sexual. Sometimes they their genetically normal testosterone level is low. So we try to bring them back to a what we consider kind of average testosterone level and they finally feel it. It is a chemical thing. It is not always a psychological thing or a a couple thing. It is a often a chemical thing where now they have sexual desire. Now they enjoy sex more because the t- testosterone is stimulating the nerves of the pelvis and giving them the neurotransmitters 
to push their oxytocin and have them have an orgasm and they come in and say, this is something I've never had before and it is so wonderful and my husband's so happy that I finally have have experienced this and are experiencing it on an ongoing basis and all it was was a hormone. Right. You were saying as we were prepping for uh, doing our research for this conversation that one of the things that you have to explain to people and it takes some time is that we can measure testosterone in the blood and so we can get what your testosterone level is or what your mm -hmm. no, your normal is but it it does its work within the cell mm -hmm. and there's competition among hormones for access to the the work mechanisms of the that cell mm -hmm. and so not everybody's volume works the same way in everybody's body right so, so you may so you have, have a high level for, yeah. but your body's resistant to it so it looks great on paper, but you're not feeling it. You need more or you need to be sensitized. Well, the reason it matters is other that. physicians, when, when people go, because you're a specialist and they come mm -hmm. to you for the specialty work and they go back to their regular doctor, sometimes their regular doctor will look at their blood work and go, oh my God, this, this is abnormal or, or this is not right. I usually find out when they don't come back because they've been scared by their primary care. Right. They feel great. Everything's working fine. They don't have side effects, but their primary care doctor scared them to death. Yeah. And a bit, usually based on their total testosterone level, which is not even important because it's invisible. Most of that is invisible to your body. It's just a tiny portion of it, and that's what I'm interested in, the free testosterone level. Most of the total testosterone passes through your body and it's is bound up, out. And it's bound yeah. up. And, and it doesn't it's not, it's not available. So your body doesn't even see it. So their their premise is wrong they were it's not their fault personally they were trained that way no one cares to know much about testosterone in women so they don't i mean there's lots of research they always go there's no research there's tons of research and it it is it is sad that they will scare people so that they can't have a normal sex life anymore because they're too scared to come back they don't tell them what's going to happen to them because nothing is going to happen to them. So, Nothing bad. So we're talking about the, the anorgasmia and the yep. ability to correct that mm -hmm. with testosterone. Right. So as we move into the question of orgasm for women, women who now have the ability to have an orgasm mm -hmm. or n were never impeded in their mm -hmm. ability to or have orgasm. In the research that we have done, there are different conversations about the question, for instance, can a woman be multi-orgasmic? And does mm -hmm. that mean she can have one, two, three, ten orgasms in, in a single sexual encounter, discrete and separate? Or does it mean she has multiple locations of orgasmic concentration? And so maybe well, you, you can have, speak to that. You can have multiple orgasms from the same, if you're stimulated in one place, you can have multiple orgasms from that one stimulation like if it's for the, from the clitoris or if it's from the g-spot so let me go back if you're looking at a woman on her back like gynecologists do the clitoris is on top most women don't know this most men do clitoris is on top then the urethra where you urinate from and then the vagina and then the rectum so it kind of goes in that order just to give us an idea so if the clitoris is being stimulated many women have, most women have the ability to do this. Many women hold back and won't do it. But many women can, if given the chance and enough stimulation, long enough stim stimulation, they can have multiple orgasms without much time in between. So they can have an orgasm and then they can continue to have sex and then have another orgasm. Or And then there are also women who have like pre-orgasms and they they all, they consider this one orgasm, but basically they have pleasure um, episodes until they reach the climax. Right. So that's so sort of an additive or building. Intensity. Right. But that's they they don't call that a multiple orgasm, but I call it a multiple orgasm because they're experiencing waves of pleasure, waves of pleasure, and waves, and their their brain is lighting up every time they're having these right. slight peaks until if they you reach have an the EKG final machine, peak. You could yeah, register EEG. and say, well, that hit mm -hmm. the intensity level. We're right. Looking at. And so we could look at that. So, so that's that. Women have the capacity to do that if they have all of their hormones, both estrogen and testosterone. And for those of you who can't take estrogen, testosterone works very well, and some people can be or, uh, 
multi-orgasmic on just testosterone, but it works better when you have both hormones. And there's lots of different physiologic reasons for that, but it really, it really does. And that's, that's something that you should, that shouldn't slow you down, but should at least be, um, let you know that it may not be quite like you were 30 so if you I don't have a, the estrogen portion. I had a couple that I worked with for a while who were having communication issues and understanding issues because of what they defined as a sexual problem. And their sexual problem was that this woman was only able to have a clitorally stimulated orgasm. Mm-hmm. And they tried to have regular penetrative sex. Mm-hmm. And the man would have an orgasm, but the woman would not. And mm-hmm. they were disappointed and upset. And they kept thinking, well, if we really love each other, we really desire each other, blah, blah, blah. What we found out was that the woman had had a hysterectomy and they had taken out the cervix. Mm-hmm. And she didn't have that capacity physiologically. She didn't have the nerve nerves the nerve that go to the, the, the cervix. The, so yes. so there, are cervi- there are cervical orgasms. Right that come from the cervix, which is at the very top of the vagina, which when penetration occurs and, and the uh, cervix is pushed or moved by the penis or it's, fingers. It strokes it, it stimulates it, it. It stimulates it, and that can create a, a different type of orgasm, a different feeling than if you have clitoral stimulation. Most women have have orgasms by clitoral stimulation. Right. It's it's the uh, most obvious because it's it's the easiest to get to. Not everyone has cervical um, or uh, penetration orgasms, but that that is from a specific bundle of nerves. There's another area called the G spot, which is once again, if if a woman was on her back in lithotomy position, like at the gynecologist, it's it's right under the bladder. It's in the vagina and and about that far up. It usually feels like a a bump of tissue, and that is actually a nerve bundle that can be stimulated and cause an orgasm. And then you can also have orgasms from um, stimulation around the vagina, around the labia, and and around that area, and also around the rectum. So. Orgasms can be from any st- any of these stimulatory areas. Everyone that has these different orgasms or has all of them, describe them differently. They feel different. But in addition to this, many what my patients will come in and they'll say, and this weird thing's happening, and I, and I think I'm like peeing on myself, and I don't want to do that when I'm having intercourse, and they're embarrassed, and they don't want to even tell me. Or they say, oh, I want to tell you something. I can't tell you. you know. And then I, and then I say, so... Are you now having ejaculatory orgasms? And they're like, "Is that what that is?" Mm-hmm. You know. So they. So <laughs> well, no, they're more like women can't do that. That's what men do. Right. And they don't right. know that women. And they can feel do like that. that's something wrong that they're doing, or they are doing, or something's wrong with their hormones, or something's wrong with them. They shouldn't be doing this. So that. But in my conversations with these people, it's a matter of comfort and a matter of realizing that this is a normal function normalizing so for important many for many women for and them and for their partners for their partner right. to know that's normal something bad didn't just happen right and the most common um uh stimulation if there's stimulation of the um of the area of the clitoris oftentimes the ejaculation that will follow will actually look like um urine but it's not it's it doesn't it's not yellow. It doesn't have the smell of urine. It's not urine. It's an ejaculatory fluid that actually comes from uh, periurethral glands right next to the uh, to the um, urethra, but it comes through the urethra and it looks like you're urinating. But it actually is very sweet. It actually, I mean, it doesn't have the smell. High sugar content. And it's blood sugar. yeah, blood sugar content, and it has <laughs> not sweet like yeah. sweet, but it has sugar in it, and it also has. Uh, kind of a slipperiness, like a fat, fatty acids are in it, so that it's it's quite different from urination. So that comes from clitoral stimulation. Then the uh, G spot, which is um, the that area that's in the vagina, but only a little bit. It's only a few uh, inch or so in. That if that's stimulated, oftentimes the ejaculation will come through the periurethral glands, which are the two little openings on either side of the urethra. And then, then you can even get a forceful 
fluid that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. And that usually has a different feeling to women who have that. They don't tend to be so worried about urine, They but but it's right there. So you'd have to be pretty discerning to know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And But that usually has a force behind it. And so, so that, it's actually a projected stream as yeah. opposed to just a flood of wetness. Right. That's that's how they describe it. Mm -hmm. And so then then the the cervical orgasms and ejaculation are, are different. The the stimulation of the cervix causes um, there's there's no gland up there to produce fluid, but fluid comes from your pelvis. Like osmosis. Like it's transudation, meaning osmosis is when fluid just flows through a membrane. Transudation means it takes energy to push the, this fluid through the vaginal wall. So the vaginal wall, it's like weeping. It's not just like wetness. It's like a pool of fluid and it can be white it can be clear but it is it usually occurs more from um cervical stimulation than from uh any of these st stimulation of the other areas but that area then it kind of rolls out after after a, a ejaculation or after the initial ejaculation so it's it's more of a just a fluid production and it also is slippery it's also usually clear or white it's not it's not an infection. It's not, I mean, it's not something that's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. It is something that's right with you. And that usually means that you've let down your guard because you can, you can hold, people have told me they hold it back mm -hmm. and they can hold it back, but it doesn't feel good to hold it back. Right. So it's like crossing your legs if you have to pee, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They somehow can hold it back from happening. But if they are very comfortable and release, then they can then allow it to come out. Um, those are the, the primary areas and the primary uh, ejaculations that women can have and do have, and there's nothing wrong with it. It is men make jokes about it, and well, they, they talk about sleeping that, in the wet spot. Oh yeah, it's not that. The jokes are different. They're you know they in movies and you've seen movies where they've kind of joked about somebody who does this. As, as it's a weird thing or a problem and they have names for it and I'm not going into that. No. But that is, but but they joke about everything so it doesn't matter. I mean, really, I mean, um, that's kind of part of, you know, women's sexuality that, that if men aren't comfortable they, they with, with it, they, they joke, joke when they're embarrassed, they joke when they're about it. <laughs> and they joke when they're immature. Right. So, so that, so it, but we shouldn't take that on and say, well, oh, that's terrible because they joke about it. Right. It's just something that's normal for us. You shouldn't be shamed. You and, need to learn about it being normal and right. not shameful. Right. And, okay. and the fact that the way women approach me on this in general is very shame. They're shame, shame based. Shame based. They're yeah. like, oh, I, I have to talk to you about this, but I, my husband yeah. asked me to talk to you about this because we're worried that something bad's happening. Nothing bad's happening. Then I've got another patient that comes in and goes, oh yeah, I have seven orgasms and I ejaculate from different places and it's awesome. And we have, I mean, I'm like, the range, oh, the range of okay. There's this is this huge range of mm -hmm. of approaches to this. And, and experience. And experience and people who feel more comfortable with their sexuality than others. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an interesting thing to see. It's also an interesting thing to talk about, to let people know that they can be anywhere on this range. Because you don't ejaculate doesn't mean something's wrong. Because you do doesn't mean something's wrong. Right. That you can be anywhere in this in this continuum and be normal and healthy and set and sexually satisfied. Now, the ejaculation doesn't always come with the orgasm. It can come in between. So once again, just like men, orgasms and ejaculation can be separated. There are cultural messages that are bound up with all of this. And Kathy and I tend to fall, doing all the research we do, and talking to so many different people, uh, along the line that when two adults are doing things that are pleasurable and satisfying to both of them, then it's okay. And as you get information to discover that this is not an abnormality or a malfunction, that it's a natural physiological process, you may have to redefine your cultural message about that process. And if you're able to do that, then that whole experience of intimacy, orgasm, and or ejaculation can be a, a bracing, stimulating, positive, enhancing thing in your relationship, mm -hmm. not something to be afraid of, embarrassed about, or ashamed of. 
So get some information. Learn about these things. Learn to love yourself Learn and for to who you are. Learn to communicate with your partner about what you want, what you like, what you need, what's going on. Don't pull away, be shamed, hide. Uh, reduce yourself in some way. As Kathy says, love yourself. Learn about your body. Learn how it works. And learn that this is a natural, uh, beautiful part of a relationship. So, and it's good for you. And, Having an orgasm is good, is good for, you. for you. So, I mean, you should be able to enjoy it just like as much as men do. Mm-hmm. Which means that M word that women often shun themselves from Mm -hmm. called masturbation uh, is also something you think you should think about sometimes. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance Healthcast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.